A town hall special from ABC4 News. America in crisis. A, a life path cut forward. short. Ya no tengo vida. Siento que no. Five, a town hall special from ABC4 News. America in crisis, a positive path forward. A life cut short. Ya no tengo vida. Siento que no respiro. Bernardo Palacios Carvajal fatally shot by Salt Lake City police officers. Drop it! Drop it! The shooting and released body cam footage sparking protests through the streets of downtown. The deadly shooting ruled justified. No charges for the officers involved. A decision made by Salt Lake County District Attorney Sim Gill. We declined to file criminal charges against either officer for his use of deadly force. In its wake, more protests. Gallons of red paint poured onto the street and splattered across the DA's office. Tagged explicatives, windows shattered. The demonstrations deemed unlawful this by police. These scenes becoming the norm played out on electronic devices throughout the world. But where do we go from here? Could the DA have done more? Or is state law preventing justice from occurring following deadly officer-involved shootings? Questions we answer in tonight's America in Crisis, A Positive Path Forward. All right, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this special ABC4 Town Hall. I'm Brittany Johnson, and joining me tonight for this half-hour special is Salt Lake County District Attorney Sim Gill. Sim Gill, thanks for being with us tonight. Happy to be here. All right, so we have a lot of ground to cover tonight, and we're going to talk more about the Bernardo Carbajal case, but I do want to take this step by step and start first with the process of officer-involved critical incidents. Now, can you tell us about your process? When the police tape comes down and investigators leave the crime scene, what happens next? Right, so what happens is the, uh, uh, the host agency, which is involved in the shooting, uh, invokes what's called the critical in incident uh, protocol. And what they're really doing is to bringing in outside agencies. Uh, uh, there are three teams, so they don't self-investigate. So this team responds, and they gather the initial scene uh, data and information. And we also embed a uh, district attorney uh, investigator as well to make sure that the process is being followed and that uh, if there's any additional questions that we can uh, have that. They spend their time trying to gather all that information. And once they gather that information, then it's presented to the district attorney's office for that initial review. And at that point, they share that information with us. We take it, we receive it, and then we start to go methodically through what they've given to us. And if there's something more that needs to be done, we ask them to follow up. And uh, sometimes they will do that. Other times, we will have our own investigators go through and follow up with that material. And once that has been compiled and brought together, then we go through the uh, factual analysis, the legal analysis, uh, and uh, gather all the forensic evidence. Uh, we have group sessions that discuss these issues with uh, multiple lawyers. And then we apply the law to the facts and then uh, come up with our conclusion, which then we will uh, uh, write it completely out, which we publish, in which we list the, the state law. We uh, list the, uh, the evidence that's been gathered. Oh, then we list uh, what the witnesses said to us, go through our analysis, and our conclusion is based on that. And then we present that in a formal uh, presentation to the community to share with them what we have. And then we publish that report uh, for the community to be able to take a look at as, as well. So I want to talk more about your two-step analysis that you have. How do citizens know it's not a biased process and that each case is based on the same analytical process each and every time? So that's a great question. So, you know, we don't have a, uh, uh, you know, a, an interest in one side or the other. So we start with the facts that are presented to us. And uh, we go through the same process. And sometimes, you know, people will say, hey, uh, this is a, just a very simple, easy thing to do, but we're very deliberate in that process, as I outlined to you. And then we, uh, we do that repeatedly every time. Uh, concluding with the publishing of that report w in which we lay out again uh, here's the law uh, here's the uh, uh, the evidence that was gathered uh, the facts th that support this 
here is the legal standard, here's our ethical standard that we have, uh, is should this be found to be unjustified, what we have to go through to the filing of charges. And so we, we have a two-step process, which is we go through the justification analysis under the law, because in the state of Utah, and in many states around the country, uh, law enforcement officers can use lethal force uh, a, as a part of their duties. And so we have to make sure that it, does it fit in that. If it doesn't fit in that, and it's unjustified, then we will go through a second process, which is now we say, okay, what is the conduct, what are the charges that are available, and what is the quantity and quality of the evidence that we have to articulate these criminal charges, and can we carry our burden of proof in the prosecution like we would in the filing of any uh, criminal case that's brought to our office for filing. Now, we'll talk more about that Utah law in just a second here, but right now, I want to talk to you about the time this process takes. Why and how was Bernardo Carbajal's decision made a lot quicker than many of your other cases that you screened, and is this rate of process actually sustainable for future cases? That's a great question. Uh, one thing, uh, you know, we were very sensitive to what the community was uh, concerned about. So we knew there was a lot of community interest, so we wanted to respect that. And, uh, and so we moved this actually ahead of the queue. Usually what our normal process is that as they come in, we sort of keep them in sequential order of when they happened. And if there's other things that we need to follow, we will continue to do that. And in this case, what we did is that we expedited because we had a request from the mayor. There was concern from the, uh, the city. And so we said, that's fair enough. We will go ahead and, and do that. And so we moved it ahead of the, uh, the list of the other uh, officer involved shootings that, that are pending. The other thing to keep in mind also is that when my administration came in, that we took on this extra work in terms of the transparency, the analysis, because that's not what the process used to be. Uh, previous pre uh, my predecessors would literally give a one or two sentence statement uh, saying that we reviewed it, there's, uh, and it's justified, and leave it at that. So we didn't get any additional resources, and we didn't get any additional prosecutors or additional investigators, but we took on this extra work uh, because we felt that our community deserved to know uh, everything that uh, was how we went through it and to publish that. Uh, and, uh, and so to answer your second part of your question, can we maintain the same kind of structure? No, I don't think we can without having some additional resources that are given to us because there are unfortunately other shooting reviews that are lined up that we have to be able to expend the time, the energy, and the same deliberate process regardless of what uh, the underlying uh, facts might be or how quickly people think that we might be able to resolve it because it's uh, very straightforward. We go through the same methodical process in every one of them. And, uh, and that is something that we won't be able to sustain because we don't have the resources for it. But we're committed to doing it as quickly as we can as we go through our process. All right, we are just getting started here with the Salt Lake County District Attorney Sim Gill. Coming up is Utah law preventing officer-involved shootings from being ruled justified. We dig into what the law unjustified. We dig into what the law says after the break. Watching ABC4 News, America in Crisis. Welcome back to America in Crisis, a positive path forward. Now, within the last week or so, we've heard a lot about Utah's law and how it allows an officer's use of lethal force. So we want to take a look at the law right now. This is section 76-2-404 of Utah state law that reads in part, a peace officer is justified in using deadly force when effecting an arrest or preventing an escape from escapee from custody following an arrest. The officer has probable cause to believe the suspect poses a threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to the others of apprehension is delayed. And the officer reasonably believes that the use of deadly force is necessary to prevent death or serious bodily injury to the officer or another person. So breaking this down for us, Sim Gill, what does this say about the legal standards governing police use of force? Well, these are standards that have been passed by our legislature. They uh, mimic a lot that are around the, st uh, the country as well. And basically what you do is you have a person in the role of a police officer, if he or she believes uh, that uh, her life is in danger or she feels that threat uh, that for other people to prevent that serious bodily injury or death to other people. 
which is a subjective uh, uh, belief that they have, which has to then be tied to the objective reality that uh, we try to gather from the facts, from uh, witnessed uh, uh, statements, uh, from uh, other forensic evidence. So there is this, this subjective component to it, as well as an objective reasonableness of it. And so what we have to do is we have to say that the fear that the officer was feeling is unreasonable, and then I have to prove that it is unreasonable objectively beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and so the, there is a favoring that occurs uh, because law enforcement are engaged in, uh, in uh, very uh, difficult situations, very violent situations. So the legislature has really sort of created this process where the bar for the uh, use of force is relatively low, uh, but the role for the uh, burden of the prosecution is really high. And so it does create these ex exceptions uh, where we have to sort of go through this process of what was going through the officer's mind and what the officer believed was unreasonable and not supported by any means that is externally available to them. So it's that balancing that we have to engage in and some would argue that that favors overly to law enforcement. Others would argue that uh, no, that's uh, uh, inherent to the dangerousness that law enforcement have, but certainly it makes it much more difficult for us as prosecutors to be able to negate that in any easy way, and then the burden is even higher if we want to move forward with the prosecution, hence the concern from the community. What they are expecting, what their values and ideals should produce is not necessarily being delivered by the law, and that creates that tension. So since taking office in 2010, your office has reviewed uh, 99 officer-involved critical incidents. Now, seven were ruled not justified, and your office didn't file charges in four of those cases, that fourth case being Bernardo Palacios Carvajal's case. Now, is the bar set too low for an officer to use lethal force? Well, I think that uh, some would argue that uh, in certain circumstances, yes. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the the law as written was written with a certain public policy in mind. And so it does uh, uh, give uh, the, uh, the subjective component and the reasonableness that I talked about earlier. In those cases, you know, we found seven to be unjustified and we three that we tried to prosecute. So it's not just only meeting that challenge that we have, and then it's also the, whether we get cooperation from law enforcement officers or not, who are the shooting officers, they have a due process uh, constitutional right not to share that information. But we still have an obligation to try to put that together. So even though sometimes I may rule something uh, unjustified, then we have to look to the next phase of it, which is do we have sufficient evidence? And can we meet the burden of proof that we have to be able to go forward in a couple of cases that we tried? Uh, and uh, and uh, we, we had a testimony that was changed by an expert. We had another one that uh, the, the subsequent uh, uh, t uh, information we got altered what we were going to be able to present. And another one we were unable to bind over. So there is also this education and uh, ability to take it to court as well. So those are all the challenges that we're facing as we try to process all these cases. Got about a few seconds left here, but I do want to ask you, how do you rebalance the system without penalizing police who have to make these life or death decisions? So I think we have to have a very open, honest, transparent conversation, which we've tried to do, to bring the facts and the reality of the case in an unvarnished uh, truth with warts and all. And then we have to ask our community, does this statute give you the outcomes that you want? And if it does not, then we need to change the law to have the different outcomes that we want. And as a result, you know, we've tried to say to our legislators today that here's 22 ideas that you can look at because that conversation needs to happen at the legislature because the officers will meet. Some may not agree with it, some, but, they, uh, but they will eventually meet the standard that we set for them. So I think truth, transparency, I think we have to share that information so we can inform our uh, electorate, our community of citizen, if this is not yielding the outcomes, then let's go ahead and change the statutes uh, to the ideals and the outcomes you do want. All right, coming up, we look into the use of force. Where is the line between necessary and excessive? Watching ABC4 News, America in Crisis. Welcome back. We continue our discussion with Salt Lake County District Attorney Sim Gill, now turning our attention to excessive force. Now, Sim, as a prosecutor, where do you see the line between necessary force and excessive force? Well, you know, it's really interesting that we talk about necessity, but in the Utah Code, we've never actually ever defined what that is. 
So we're forced to go back to look at the four corners of the statue that's there and see if it fits in there as a part of necessity. Uh, and the excessive force under that same analysis is that anything that would fall out of that harbor that the legislature has ca uh, carved out. But that doesn't always satisfy uh, in the, in, in, uh, for people because sometimes necessity uh, needs to be more fully articulated. So like today, our office uh, sent out uh, these 22 proposals to start this conversation. And we actually uh, provide a definition where we talk about uh, that necessity is defined, uh, in, in, I'm paraphrasing, that there is no reasonable alternative that's available uh, to use of force. Uh, and we start to uh, define that. As we start to define that, then maybe we can narrow the parameters than the sort of the open-endedness that the current statute leaves uh, in place. And excessive force, there certainly it could be the force that is, doesn't fall within that four safe uh, corners of that statute, and you uh, go beyond that. And certainly that's one uh, way to look at it, but it, it, it is clearly an area that needs to be more clearly defined. All right. Does there need to be a change in the way investigations of officer-involved shootings and alleged excessive force are handled? Yeah, I, I think uh, our office started out uh, 10 years ago when nobody wanted to publish reports. We found resistance from that, the idea of sharing trans, uh, with uh, transparency what happened, what the law is, and put that out there. So we uh, led out on that. At the time that we started, there were about four or six uh, prosecutors around the country uh, that were doing it. Uh, and now it's majority of uh, are going out and doing that. So that was moving the ball in that direction. We were the, also the ones who advocated that the police agencies should now self-investigate. So we went up on the hill when we helped change the law to create this uh, idea of outside agencies coming in. So as we move that ball down, I think the next step is maybe we need to think about purely independent investigation so there is no law enforcement agency that's tied to that. And, uh, and so that would move it further down. So I think that's one part of it. The another part is that we proposed today was also giving uh, prosecutors access to the grand jury as an investigative tool where we can put uh, people under oath so when people's memories fade or they don't want to cooperate, uh, then they know that there is a penalty under oath that they're telling. So the grand jury system can serve as an investigative tool. And I think those are the directions that we need to uh, continue to work for that independence of investigations. All right, we still have much more to talk to you about, and that's coming up after the break. So in addition to protesting, what steps can citizens take to change the law? The ABC4 News, America in Crisis. Thanks for sticking with us tonight. Within the last couple of months, the call for police reform has been revived. Question for you, uh, Sim Gill. How do we bridge the gap between law enforcement and the community? Well, I think, first of all, we need to honestly acknowledge the fact that there is a large segment of our community that feels unheard, unseen, unresponded to. And, there, the, and the protests that we have in Salt Lake are no different than the protests around the country. While this is also an indictment of the criminal justice system and law enforcement and brutality, it is more importantly an indictment of our entire political system where this, these voices have been uh, shut out, out of the uh, decision making, out of accountability, uh, out of having a sense that they have a say in the matter. So that's one part that we have to acknowledge that, that there is a real reason why people are feeling this way. The other part is we need to also recognize that law enforcement has a difficult job to do. But I genuinely believe law enforcement will rise to the standards that we set for them. And I think it's incumbent upon us that as a society, if these don't meet our ideals, then we need to uh, create the standards and the change in the laws that do reflect what we want our society to be. And that's something that we need to do legislatively. But it starts by recognizing that these voices that are protesting out there have a reason to protest. And at the same time, we are also have a difficult job to do with law enforcement. And they're not exclusive of each other. There is something that we can do about it. Digging more into that, what changes do need to be made if citizens want police officers held accountable for acts of violence? Well, I think that, first of all, uh, we need to recognize that different groups play different roles in it. So, for example, people think that I have the power to hire and fire police officers. I don't. 
that really is something that mayors uh, who appoint uh, chiefs of police, they get to dictate more uh, directly what policies, what procedures, what training, what uh, values that they want reflected in that law enforcement they need to also talk about the, the relationship they have with their police unions. What does that mean in terms of uh, uh, talking about benefits versus accountability? And, uh, and then we have to start talking with the legislators who are waking up in this moment and saying, geez, we want to do something, and that the, here are the things, if you want to change, here are specific things that you can do if that is the objective that we want to achieve. So I think that these are the, we need to recognize it's a much larger problem. And then, of course, uh, we need as, as prosecutors to be as open and transparent as we can so we have the tools to reflect those concerns about accountability as well. So everybody has a role to play in it, uh, including the most important role of our citizens who are out there who need to get involved politically in this process and be part of that conversation. And we need to make sure that institutionally we don't shut those voices out because they have something very important to share with us. Now, these protests have been going strong for almost two months now, and you've stated multiple times that you do support peaceful protests, but you do say that the work does not stop there. So if people are unhappy with Utah's justice system, what can they do in addition to protests? I think protests demonstrate what is not being met in our community. And, and uh, when we talk about, this didn't happen over, overnight. This happens every 20 or 30 years. And we have listening tours, we have commissions that are created, we do little platitudes, and we move on to the next issue. This moment feels differently because I think for the first time, I think policy ma makers are genuinely listening, and that means that, the, uh, the, that our citizens cannot just simply raise those issues, but then they have to take the next step. Because when we go into 45 days into the legislative session, that's where the laws that are made will give us the kind of long-term systemic, susta uh, sustainable changes that we want. Not just platitudes, not just uh, episodic uh, wins, not just uh, do what makes us feel good right now, but how do we make systemic changes? Uh, issues of implicit bi uh, bias, uh, issues of uh, uh, systemic racism that we have to acknowledge that's there, issues of criminal justice reform. So these are all important issues, and the, our citizens have a direct role to play in that. All right, thank you so much, Sim Gill, for joining us tonight. Much more of this conversation will be found on our website, abc4.com. Thank you again. We'll see you back here at 10.